Hello everybody, this is Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by Oscar winning editor Paul Hirsch. On today's episode, we will talk extensively about his long career as one of Hollywood's best editors. Throughout his career, he has worked on pictures such as Carrie, Star Wars, Blowout, Footloose, Falling Down, Mission Impossible, Ray and many more. In November, his autobiography, A Long Time Ago, In a Cutting Room Far, Far Away, My 50 Years Editing Hollywood Hits, will be released. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Um, Paul, as I mentioned, I would love to talk about your career in general and, of course, about your autobiography. You probably have many stories to tell. And you had started working with Brian De Palma pretty early on, I believe in 1970. Um, actually, actually 1969. 69. Yes. And you and Brian had collaborated on 11 movies, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how did you meet him and how did your collaboration come about back then? My uh, brother, Charles, uh, had a job as a junior, junior, junior executive at Universal Pictures in New York. And his job was to uh, meet uh, young writing and directing talents and, um, if possible, you know, um, promote people that he thought were uh, talented. I think in reality he was just meant as a lightning rod to deflect uh, attention away from people who were more <laughs> senior to him uh, and a way to avoid having to, you know, uh, meet with all these people who were looking for money from the studio. But and along, his, along the way, he met um, Brian De Palma, who came to Universal looking for funding for one of his projects. And um, he and Brian started talking, and they came up with a, an idea for a movie together uh, entitled Greetings. Now, Greetings, uh, this was in 1967 or 8, and the Vietnam War was uh, at its height at that time. Uh, the U.S. government was drafting about 40,000 men a month. And Greetings is the traditional uh, salutation at the beginning of a letter from the draft board. If you got a letter that started Greetings, you knew you, you were in trouble. <laughs> so uh, the picture was entitled Greetings, and it was about three young men who are desperately trying to avoid being drafted and being sent off to war. And it was loosely based on the uh, Godard film Masculin Féminin. So Brian uh, and Chuck my brother Chuck, Charles or Chuck, um, proposed this idea to Universal and they were, they were rejected. So my brother raised the money independently from family friends and they shot the picture in his spare time. I think he had uh, a two week vacation and they shot the picture during that time and then Brian edited the film. Meanwhile, I had a job uh, working at a company in New York that made trailers and TV spots for feature films, mostly United Artists and MGM. And um, I was cutting trailers, and when they finished Greetings, they needed a trailer for it, so they came to me. And I cut a trailer for them, and I met Brian then, and he and I hit it off. We were simpatico in our personalities, and... Uh, Greetings turned out to be sort of a minor hit. In fact, it won the Silver Bear at the Berlin Film Festival that year. And um, Sigma 3, which was the company that released it, decided to finance a sequel to it, originally entitled Son of Greetings. I was proposed to Brian by my brother as the editor, and Brian agreed, and that's how I got my start. I was 23 years old and didn't know much of anything at that point, but I didn't know what I didn't know. So that was a big help. 
I thought, yeah, I can do that, you know, not knowing what I what I was taking on. You have done, I think, five consecutive films with Brian starting in the 70s or in the late 60s, also including Carrie. And what can you tell me about working with him? I mean, when I'm watching his movies, there are also always several aspects, several things which strike me right away. I mean, his great camera work, his great eye for um, for cinematography, then the musical yeah. score, and of course the editing, which is fabulous. Thank how, you. How do you approach editing with Brian De Palma? Well, Brian was very supportive of me, and um, I'm very grateful to him for um, for that support that he gave me, and he empowered me to make. Uh, he encouraged me to make decisions on my own, and he would supply he would tell me what he had in mind and then it was up to me to make it work um so i had a great deal of autonomy uh within the framework of what his intention was so um i think what distinguishes his pictures is his visual storytelling sense and he was inspired by uh hitchcock's films to the degree that people accused him of plagiarizing Hitchcock. But yeah. the result was he developed a style very distinctly his own and which is uh, extraordinarily visual as opposed to what he called talk fests of just a photographic record of actors acting. He wasn't interested in that. He was in interested in the, the plastic possibilities of the medium in terms of camera movement and, and, uh, constructing what we called um, set pieces that incorporated these camera movements and also editorial ideas as well. As for cutting five pictures of his in a row, nobody else would give me a job, was, <laughs> was the truth. <laughs> But fortunately, uh, the pictures became uh, successively, you know, more and more successful and um, he started doing them more regularly. But between the first and second film was a three-year gap. Yeah. And between the second and third film was a two-year gap. And after that, he started doing them every year, which uh, was fortunate for me. He would, he would let me do the first cut and then present it to him, and he would, then we would work together to, to arrive at the final cut. Uh, which project of all the projects you've worked on with brian stands out the most for you personally well, carrie i like because it's i've seen it recently and it's it's very economical and simple and straightforward in terms of the story and the characters it's very clear and the the scenes between sissy spacek and her mother played by piper laurie are really terrific they were both nominated for academy for academy awards which is Very rare with a horror film. It was also Stephen King's first film based on his first novel. And um, I really think there's a kind of rightness to all the choices that were made. I mean, very often in a film, I'll be overruled about something and I'll have to live with a cut or a non-cut or whatever that I don't entirely agree with. But I have to say that with Carrie, I'm pretty much in sync with every choice that was made, you know? Um, on the other hand, Obsession was the second film that we did with Bernard Herrmann. And that score uh, has a particular uh, resonance for me. It was um, composed and conducted and recorded the year that Benny died. So. Um, and it's a very emotional and romantic score and, and very powerful and, and sort of unrestrained and exemplary of the kind of conviction and force that Benny could bring to bear in a, in a musical score. And yeah. uh, for me, that has a very powerful uh, hold on me. So, um, and then, of course... Phantom of the Paradise is so sort of outlandish and crazy um, that uh, it has a, you know, so it's hard to distinguish which is my favorite. <laughs> But um, 
uh, I love working with Brian and um, uh, hope to, you know, I guess it's not realistic to think we'll ever work together again. But um, like I say, he, he endorsed my work. He empowered me, encouraged me, and he was my mentor. Uh, yeah. We were, I was 23 when I started with him and um, worked only for him throughout my 20s. I guess I think I was, yeah, I was already 30 by the time I worked on a film for any other director, and that was Star Wars. Yeah. Um, why do you think you will never work again with, with Brian, if I may ask? Well, we're getting old, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My book says, you know, 50 years in the editing room. That's that's a lot of dailies. Yeah, that's a that's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Brian still, you know, or has released or shot some movies in the last couple of years, and I hope he will um, continue continue to do so, and maybe just maybe you will. Um, have another collaboration in the future. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, but speaking of his early work, I mean, I I loved Carrie. I mean, it's 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 a very good movie, and it also has some of his trademark style. Also, the on um, the slow motion sequences or um, the split screen, uh, I believe, was in Carrie as well. And yes. there was a lovely uh, slow motion sequence at the beginning and the, in the locker room. And just yesterday, I rewatched um, the Fury. And uh, it also contains some two major um, slow motion sequences, also some very um, nice editing, and also a great musical score by by John Williams. You know, I haven't seen The Fury in many years, probably not since it came out. I I don't like to watch my films because by the time you finish, as an editor, by the time you finish a film, you've seen it so many times that it's almost painful to watch again. You know, so. <laughs> Uh, this always, I had an interview recently with some, um, um, some young guys who were very involved in, uh, you know, very, uh, passionate about the Mission Impossible films. Oh yeah. And they said, do you remember that scene in Mission Impossible where, and I'd say, no. <laughs> <laughs> they said, when was the last time I said, they said, when was the last time you saw it? I said, well, what year did it come out? You know? And they were surprised that I didn't watch my old films, but. Uh, it's really the case that uh, you get to the end, you really can't stand to watch it one more time. Yeah. So um, Fury is one that I haven't rewatched. Um, I remember having some problems with the logic of it, you know. Um, yeah. The uh, the the final scenes, uh, the, the penultimate scenes, mm -hmm. where Robin is able to fly around the room that he's in. Yeah. And yet he falls to his death. It didn't I thought what? That doesn't make sense, you know. Yeah, I mean. So, um, so I had some problems with that, and 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 then there there was a scene with uh, Fiona Lewis, uh, in which he telekinetically raises her up and then spins her around. Yeah, I thought that scene was particularly. Uh, well, I thought it was it was just too. Uh, sadistic for my sensibility in all honesty i didn't really want to do the fury but i had just finished working on star wars which brian had been very instrumental in getting for me uh -huh. so i didn't really f and he had you know he'd been my main support uh for all these years i didn't feel i could turn him down his sensibility is is um very particular and uh in all candor, not entirely aligned with my own, you know, so. Yes, sure. I mean, also very nice of him to really fully support you and also on, you know, getting Star Wars. And to me, Brian De Palma is one of the best filmmakers ever. I mean, um, also in, in, in terms of craftsmanship, I mean, he has shot uh, quite a few movies, which, which I'm not too fond of, which I actually, and, and some of them I even dislike, I must admit. Yeah. Um, but he has done terrific, terrific stuff. I heard recently that, um, I heard a quote from Francis Coppola, who said something along the lines of, um, you know, of all of us back then, Brian was the real genius. Like I said in my um, introduction, or uh, the first question I asked, when, when, I, when, I, when I talked about, you know, his, um, 
his tracking shots and his camera work and, and also in, in films which were not critically acclaimed like um, Snake Eyes for instance which which stars Nicolas Cage um, the first 10 or 12 minutes of the film rarely feature any any edits it's very fantastic camera work you can see the camera move around then the actors in the, in the scene and the, uh, there are very few directors and that's my my humble opinion who would ever do that especially in this day and age i don't think there there is anybody who does it anymore you know gravity was yeah uh, you know an attempt to, to do that in the opening shot i think went on for 20 minutes or something or whatever yeah and then, correct and then there was birdman that was all essentially one shot in theory i mean it was made up of many elements but uh, there were no visible cuts in it. So, yeah. and I think there have been some, you know, experiments along those lines. But I think Brian was, um, and then Hitchcock had done it with rope. You know, he'd, he'd yes. done it, but that came off as sort of a stage play. But I think that Brian was very interested in, uh, like I say, extending the plastic possibilities of the medium, and um, and it takes courage to commit to shooting uh, a film that way. Uh, and I think nowadays with digital cameras and no limit on how much you can shoot um, directors, some of the directors I've worked with more recently, um, one in particular would um, just set up coverage for everything and, and cover every action from every conceivable angle, make no decisions on the floor, and then leave all those decisions up to us in the editing room. And then we would make all the choices that he failed to make in shooting. And then he would look at the cut and say, no, it's all wrong. So that's very frustrating. But um, no, Brian is, is a real artist in terms of uh, following an inner sensibility that tells him that there is a particular way that this must be done. And, uh, obeying that that impulse and i would love to talk about star wars i mean i was going to ask you about it anyway but you um told me that brian was also instrumental in getting you the job you had won the academy award for best editing uh, on star wars along with your peers richard chu and marshall lucas yes. and of course we don't need to mention how incredibly popular Star Wars has become. and But how demanding was the editing process on this film, which probably also requ um, required lots of attention to detail? Um, when Brian and I worked on Phantom of the Paradise, it was an independent production that was shot in New York, and it was picked up for distribution by 20th Century Fox. And... Um, I got a call from Brian from Los Angeles. I was living in New York at that time. And he said, listen, the excitement about the picture is tremendous. You got to come out here this weekend. There's going to be a screening and a party. And so I flew out um, with my wife and we went to the screening. And afterwards, there was an after party. And at the party, uh, I met this young woman who was uh, Marshall Lucas and we were introduced and she said, oh, you're the editor? Come, yeah, I want you to meet George. He loves your work. So she took me by the hand and dragged me through the crowd and then I met George and um, he seemed very unassuming. He was just, you know, dressed in um, sort of a uh, button-down shirt with the, you know, with the tails untucked and wearing blue jeans and sneakers and just looked like an ordinary guy. And uh, he had also by that time already directed American Graffiti, which was a tremendous hit. It was, I think at the time, the most successful film Hollywood ever put out in terms of uh, return on investment. And it cost less than a million dollars. It made over 50. So um, anyway, and it had a tremendous impact on people of my generation. The, uh, the tagline was, uh, where were you in 62? And that was the year I graduated high school. So anyway, it spoke to me very directly. But I was a, in, in awe of George. And uh, we met at that time. So um, uh, some, so that was 1974. And then um, 
in my book uh, a long time ago in a cutting room far, far away. I talk about uh, this in more detail, but um, I'll simply say that while I was working on Carrie, um, George was shooting Star Wars in England, and we were in New York cutting, and when George and Marsha finished in England, they uh, George had fired his his film editor and was very unhappy with the cut, and they flew through New York and... We screened Carrie for them, and um, then he continued on to San Francisco. And a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from Marsha asking if I'd like to join them working on the film. They were under uh, time pressure because George was so unhappy with the cut that he wanted to recut the, the film from beginning to end. And he had hired Richard Chu and... Uh, in in the in San Francisco, and Richard had started work, but they could tell right away that they weren't going to make their deadline without more help. And at that time, Marsha was um, dedicated to assembling. Uh, she was building the end battle, which was composed of um, great, uh, a lot of small pieces, a lot of elements, and. Um, she had nothing to, to uh, represent the exterior shots in the battle. So she resorted to using um, black and white World War II uh, aerial footage to stand in for the, the exterior shots that were to be produced by the visual effects people. So she was deep into that, which is an extraordinarily complicated puzzle. Um, and Richard was recutting the film and it wasn't going fast enough. So they brought me in. So when I came in, um, I was put to work on some of the early scenes and then we worked our way through the reels. Um, if Richard was working on reel one, I would start on reel two. And then when I finished reel two, by that time, maybe Richard was on reel three and I would jump to reel four and we sort of leapfrogged our way through the film. Um, recutting it till it was all finished. And at a certain point, um, George pulled me off working on the, the recut and had me concentrate on the end battle because Marsha had gotten it to a point that it was almost, uh, it was at the point of needing to be fine cut and locked because the visual effects people needed so much time to, uh, to accomplish the shots. We had to, we had to lock it sort of early on. So we had this sort of marathon tag team um, editing session for several days where we would take turns. Marsha and I would take turns sitting at the chem, making the changes. I would be at the chem and she would be sitting on the couch behind me with George. And then after a few hours, she would get up and I would sit on the couch with George and she would handle the chem and so we went a few, a few days like that until we got the sequence locked down. So it was really, you know, Brian's uh, friendship with George. They had met in 1971 on the Warner Brothers lot when um, George was shooting THX 1138. And, George, and, and Brian was shooting Get to Know Your Rabbit, um, a picture with uh, Orson Welles, and, among others, and Tommy Smothers. And uh, Brian got into some political trouble with the studio and he got fired from it. So, but during that time, he and George had forged this friendship and uh, it was his friendship with George and, and George liking um, Phantom of the Paradise and so forth that sort of resulted in me being offered Star Wars. Great, great work, great success. And you also went on to um, to work on the um, the Empire Strikes Back, um, which was then um, directed by uh, Irvin Kirshner. Um, is there any particular reason you didn't return for another Star Wars, if I may ask? It's a bit of a complicated story, which is also in the book. But um, when Empire Strikes Back was released, George had made a decision to um, maintain a a format 
that we had established in Star Wars in terms of the titles at the beginning and the titles at the end. And there was this card that said, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And then there was a roll up, uh, sort of a crawl going off into space that sort of set up uh, the opening scenes. And um, at the end, uh, they had all the main titles at the end, beginning with the director's title that was brought on with it. We did it with an iris, uh, a very fast iris, sort of like a punctuation point, uh, an exclamation point, actually. Um, so he wanted to reproduce that, what we had done on Star Wars. He wanted the, the same format for the titles on Empire Strikes Back. So uh, when we brought on Kirshner's title, um, the DGA uh, fined George because there was a rule in the DGA that if the producer's name is at the head of the film, the director's name must be also. And George pointed out that his name was not at the head of the film, but they said that the company, Lucasfilm, um, constituted his name. And therefore, having Kirshner's name at the end was a violation of DGA rules. And Kirshner was, you know, he said, listen, I love having my name at the end because when my name comes on the screen, everybody applauds. You know, he was, he was thrilled with the way it was, but the DGA wouldn't go for it. So they find George, and the next day the Writers Guild find him also. So George was furious at this, and he vowed not to hire a DGA director for the third film. So um, he, in fact, hired uh, Richard Marquand, who was an, an Englishman, on these films, there the, the the crew consists of almost a thousand people. They're painters and set designers and 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 craftspeople of all kinds and uh, sound people and and myriad different you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And Marquand was given the right to hire two people out of these hundreds. One was his cinematographer, and the other was his editor. Thanks for sharing this um, great story. I mean, also, 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 lots of politics involved. I mean, I, I, w I would have never guessed it was that difficult. You know, that the circumstances uh, surrounding this film and the project were um, that difficult to begin with. You know, also concerning the DGA um, director Guild of America. So that's um, that was news to me on, on on Star Wars. How did winning the Academy Award back then change your life and career as a whole? Uh, after I won the Academy Award, my life changed in the sense that I became um, noticed by other directors and started getting offers that I might never have gotten otherwise. I was approached to do a film um, for um, Dino De Laurentiis by Frank Pearson. Frank had won an Academy Award for the screenplay for Dog Day Afternoon, and he was directing a film um, called King of the Gypsies based on a book by Peter Maas, who had written Serpico. Mm -hmm. The cinematographer was Sven Nickvist, who worked with Ingrid, uh, Ingmar Bergman all those years, and uh, I suddenly found myself in very fast company, uh, surrounded by people much older than me who had, who had done extraordinary things. Um, and I'm sure that is due very much to uh, my work on Star Wars and the and the Academy Award. Now I would love to talk about your your book, which will be released on November fifth. It's called yes. It's called A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far Far Away. And Paul, when did you decide it was time to prepare a book, a detailed book? on your career as an editor and your time in the movie business? Well, the book uh, became, um, the, the book came out of my being on location in Vancouver without my wife. Uh, this is in 2000. And uh, on the weekends, I was alone and kind of bored. And I had had some success telling these stories, my war stories, so to speak, uh, on the set. I'd visit with people and I'd tell these stories. And, and uh, it occurred to me, I thought, I should, I should really write these stories down. I wasn't thinking about a book quite yet. 
Uh, but I thought, you know, these are good stories. I should write them down. And so I started doing that. And then as soon as I, I, writ, I had written one chapter, I thought, you know, this, this really could be a book. And I did something very uh, wise at the time. Uh, I made an outline of all the movies I'd worked on and all the little anecdotes that I remembered and the things that I'd learned. And, and, um, and I, I made an outline for myself. Uh, and then over the years since then, I would um, refer to this outline and, and keep writing. Now, my career was, you know, I was, I was still in the, uh, uh, the thick of my career and I would only work on this project in my spare time and there were two and three year chunks where I never even looked at it because I was busy at work. But as I got older and time went by, uh, the periods of employment got shorter and the periods of unemployment got longer. And uh, I found I had more and more time to work on the book. And I finally finished a draft of it in 2017, I'd say. I think if I hadn't made that outline and tried to write the book today, um, I wouldn't remember <laughs> as much as I was able to, remember, <laughs> able to remember back then because, you know, the the disc gets full. Yeah, I think it's, I meant the book to be entertaining and informative. Um, it's, it's not a, an autobiography per se because I don't go into my personal life terribly much. It's mostly about my my career in the business, my experiences in the business, mm -hmm. my, uh, my learning process, because I didn't go to film school. So I had to, I had to learn how to edit sort of the way, uh, you know, you go to a museum and you see art students copying yes. the, uh, the masters. And that's sort of my approach to, uh, to my work. I would watch a lot of movies and then I would try to achieve some of the effects that I admired in my own work, you know, and um, so it's not a how-to book. Uh, it's meant to it's meant to be amusing and um, <laughs> and also to give a picture of what it was like to have a career as as an editor um, and the difficulties. And I didn't I didn't spend a lot of time dealing with um, the pictures that failed terribly much uh, because. I've been so fortunate in my career and I've worked on so many pictures that, uh, that made an impact with the public that I thought to include stories about, you know, well, this, this director didn't listen to me and he, you know, I didn't want to be whining and moaning and complaining when I've had so much good fortune. Nobody wants to hear that, you know? Yeah. So, um, I concentrated mostly on, on the pictures that people have heard of, uh, with some exceptions, if I thought it made a good story, and there were some of those, but um, right. uh, it's meant to be fun. It's meant to be a good read. It's not, as I say, it's not a how-to book. Although I do include um, observations that I've made about um, editing, and yes. also some of the aesthetic problems that we faced, and mm -hmm. what our solutions to those were. Okay. So um, I think it's I think it's a good read. I hope it is. Right. I mean, uh, I'm sure that young up and coming editors will also find this uh, very intriguing, and I'm sure they will find lots of stories. And also, if they want to kind of you know seek advice to a certain degree, I'm sure they will also find it in this book, even though you just said it's not a how-to book, but I'm sure they will find it very interesting. I hope so. I, I think the business is in, in such flux. I mean, the, the changes that are going on um, in technology are having a profound effect on the way uh, the business is conducted. So, yes, yes. I mean, if people look to me for advice on how to get into the business, I would say, well, it's a whole different world today. I have no idea, you know. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's a particular record of, it's a record of a particular time, and uh, I, I hope it's useful. I, I think mostly it'll be uh, entertaining is what I hope for. You know? Right. And do you also, um, to some extent, um, share stories um, 
on the politics of the film business and how difficult it can be to get a certain film made and also struggles with the MPAA, for instance? Uh, no, I don't really go into that. You know, when, when, as an editor, uh, I don't really deal with projects until they're actually green lit. So I don't have a lot of experience with those kind of struggles of trying to get financing for this or that. Um, uh, one of the fortunate things about being an editor is that every project is a go project by the time I'm hired. So um, I like being busy. And one of the things about an editing career that suited me was that I could stay busy at all times, you know, or pretty much um, uh, until, of course, the inevitable uh, career arc starts to take a downward trajectory. Um, that's why they call it an arc. Um, yes. But um, it's I've been very fortunate, and uh, um, yeah, I have no complaints. Right. Um, without giving too much away, Paul, um, I'm sure you will also, or I'm sure you also wrote about your work with uh, Joel Schumacher on the film Falling Down. Yes. Which I think is one of the finest films of the 90s. Um, very socio-critical um, to a large extent. And what do you remember um, about working with Joel Schumacher and Falling Down in general? Well, Joel is one of the most interesting uh, personalities that I came into contact with. And uh, um, he... Uh, One of the things I remember about Falling Down in particular was how little film he shot. I think of all the films I've done, he shot the least, um, which is remarkable to me because um, he got everything he needed. Uh, it was really remarkable. Um, but a really full discussion of Falling Down uh, isn't possible uh, in the time that we have, I would simply say that I think it's one of the one of the more interesting chapters in the book. He's a very um, outspoken and sort of flamboyant personality, <laughs> and, uh, and, and very funny too. He's a funny, you know, amusing man, um, and I agree with you. I think it's funny about falling down because of all the films that I've worked on. Um, it's, I think it's a really good picture and it doesn't get a lot of attention these days, but I thought it was, um, an interesting look at a, a character who was in, in certain ways, uh, a foretaste of the, um, populist nationalist phenomenon that we're seeing all over the world today. Yes. Sort of a displaced um, middle class worker whose um, whose job is he's lost his job because the end of the Cold War meant that uh, the spending on uh, defense had gone down and he had worked in the defense industry and uh, he's finding himself sort of unmoored and um, no longer in the privileged position that he had occupied earlier. So uh, I think it's sort of a, a prescient film about a condition that we're seeing more widely today. Yes, I mean, totally, totally true. And yeah, the, Michael Douglas's character in this film is on the edge, you know, he, he lost his job. And there are several other elements, you know, that contribute to his um, to his state of mind, you know, especially at the beginning when he when he's in gridlock and then in the traffic jam, and then all of a sudden, you know, he just you know opens up the door and goes on this um, on, on this rampage, and there are several aspects of the film which I feel are very true, you know, uh, e e even today, you know, th there is a socio critical um, uh, element of this film. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's you know such a transgressive act to leave your car in the middle of a traffic jam on a on a freeway. Uh, it's something we all sort of fantasize about, you know. But who would ever do that? Who would ever just walk away from their car? You know. I mean, um, anyway, I thought it was a great 
great way to start off a picture. Um, I would love to. Um, I would love to uh, talk a little bit about uh, your work with um, John Hughes, as you had worked on two of my favorite comedies of all time, uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and probably my favorite comedy ever, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Um, a com comedies of this kind are, today are pretty rare. And what can you tell me about the work with John Hughes and how he worked uh, with you as an editor and how you kind of delivered this, this comedy classic or those comedy classics? Right, well, that's, that's a whole hour in itself, Michael. Okay. <laughs> Um, John was a writer um, and very different from De Palma, for instance, in his approach to filmmaking. He was all about the words uh, and the characters. And um, he said to me once, he said, I don't really understand coverage. I think it has something to do with math, uh, which is his way of saying that he wasn't really that interested in that, you know. Uh, but... Um, so he wasn't primarily uh, motivated by uh, the visual possibilities of film. It was more about um, humorous and character and uh, these things. Um, not to say that I mean he came up with some great images as well, but that wasn't his that wasn't his motor. That wasn't his primary um, guiding principle. Um, John would write his scripts in a kind of a fugue state. He would write them very quickly. I think he wrote Ferris in a week or something. And, um, and uh, he would sit at the typewriter and, or word processor or whatever and, and write as fast as he could type. He came into the mix of Ferris Bueller's Day Off and handed me an envelope containing 60 pages Uh, that he had written the night before. And I said, what's this? He said, it's the first 60 pages of my next project, which was Playing Strains and Automobiles. And he had written the first 60 pages at one sitting. And um, he wrote, you know, six pages an hour for 10 hours. And it was like he was taking dictation directly from a muse. The, uh, the scripts were never rewritten. He would write these brilliant first first drafts, and then he would insist on shooting the whole thing, even if it was too long, which it was. So he, um, he would make the cuts only after it had been shot. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles filmed for 85 days, which is a very long schedule for uh, a 90-minute film. Yeah. Um, and the first cut ran three hours and 45 minutes. <laughs> So when we sat down to start cutting it down, uh, on the first pass, just taking out big chunks, you know, just forget that, forget that, let's lose that, forget that. We went through in one pass and took out an hour and 15 minutes and got it down to two and a half hours. So I said to John, I said, you know, we just took out 28 days of shooting. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just shrugged. He just said, okay, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah, he was, he, was a, he was gifted with this access to a muse, um, extraordinary talent, singular in my experience. He died way too young and, uh, yeah. yeah, it was a great loss. I mean, yeah. those pictures were, yeah, and there's some great stuff yeah. in the outtakes. Yeah, and it had to be, I mean, it was just, pictures were just too long at the start yeah he was an extraordinary filmmaker and a great writer and he i still miss miss him i miss his pictures i mean i yeah. I, I, i can't think of a single john Hughes film um, with the exception of weird science um which i which i didn't like uh, it's um he has shot some of the best comedies ever, you know? Yeah. Well, his career is very similar to, uh, Preston Sturges. Preston Sturges came to Hollywood, made some of the greatest comedies ever in the space of 10 years. And that, and that was it, you know, and, and John sort of 
operated for a very limited time and and then left Hollywood. He wanted to have nothing to do with uh, the business. He was he was very unhappy with having to deal with studio executives. I had heard that he had been recruited for a project um, sort of late in his life and uh, he was going to fly to L.A. to meet with the studio to talk about the picture. And somebody from the studio called him up and said, John, we're so thrilled, we're so happy to be working with you. Uh, we just, you know, we love the script. It's just a few little things, a few little minor changes we want to talk to you about, but we'll, we'll discuss it on Monday when you get here. And uh, Monday comes and he doesn't show up. <laughs> so... They call him, and it turned out he had all his phone numbers changed. So, really? <laughs> so that was that. Okay. Yeah, he didn't, want to, he didn't want to hear their notes. Okay. That's quite a story. <laughs> okay, crazy. I mean, I'm sure many people are fed up or almost fed up with um, lots and lots of input from, from executives. Um, but um, I guess that's just the way the... Um, The cookie crumbles. I mean, there are many people involved, lots of feedback, lots of inputs, and uh, I think it's pretty hard to find a common ground and to really um, sell your vision of a movie. And also, especially these days when everything you know changes constantly. So, it I think it doesn't get any easier today. You know? Well, they operate differently today than they used to. When I started out in the business. The key elements in any film, the key element in the creative package was the director. And if a film was successful, the studio would come to the director and they'd say, what do you want to do next? Because they recognized that the director was the key. Um, but today, projects are developed by studios, um, creative departments. They call themselves the creatives. And the creatives, uh, these committees, write the or commission writers, um, to write the scripts that read as if they were written by a committee and approved by a committee, which they are. And then, only then do they start looking for a director and they cast a director for the film in the way that you would pick an actor to play a, a role in the picture. So yeah. um, it's a different process and that's why we have all these Marvel movies because... Yeah. You know, the, this this is the way. This is what works for the audience, and yes. and um, they're not really interested in uh, directors. Uh, well, I shouldn't say not really interested, but the directors' creative contributions are are diminished. I'd say. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to work in a period when directors were given more freedom. Um, Brian talks about it as you know. He looks back on those those years and he says, "Oh, we were kings. They were able to do things then that you could never do today." Yeah. Um, but um, you know, things change. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Paul, I'm looking forward to reading your book, and it's gonna be released on November 5th, as I mentioned before, and I'm sure it's a true page-turner. It's available now for pre-order on Amazon, Barnes and & Noble, and on the website for the publisher, Chicago Review Press. Uh, you can pre-order it now, and there's going to be um, an Audible, um, an audio version of the book as well, on Audible. I'm sure it's a fantastic book and a great read. And I hope to find many more stories on your great accomplishments and work with directors and uh, films like Mission Impossible and uh, Ray and Ghost, um, Ghost Protocol. And I would like to thank you for taking so much time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate that. And I had a blast talking to you. And I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well, Paul. I did. It's my pleasure. <laughs>